inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. I've got a real interesting guest joining us on the podcast today. He's a rental property investor, but he also owns a property management company where he manages 400 rentals. So he's got an interesting perspective because he sees things as an investor, but he also has a lot of experience because he's dealt with so many properties and so many tenants. So today he's going to share with us a a bunch of ways to make your rental property more profitable. So let's take a really quick break. We'll thank our sponsors. We'll come right back and we'll meet Mike Connolly from Fremont, California. The first step in buying a rental property is to get pre-qualified. And I would suggest you work with a lender that specializes in working with investors because The last thing you want to have happen is to get to closing and find out the money's not there and you can't close. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender and she'll pre-qualify you for free if you mention Rental Income Podcast. Find out more today. Contact Chaley at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E lendinggroup.com. NMLS 42056. Having to evict a tenant is painful. The best way to protect yourself from evictions is to screen tenants, and the best way that I know of to screen tenants is TransUnion Smart Move. It's a really valuable online screening tool delivering credit, eviction, and background reports in minutes, and their proprietary tenant credit check predicts evictions 15% better than generic credit scores. See why over 4 million landlords have used SmartMove to make better leasing decisions. Use code RENTAL25 at checkout to save 25% at TenantScreening.com. That's code RENTAL25 at TenantScreening.com. Mike, let's start off with you telling us a little bit about your property management business. I manage uh, predominantly single-family homes about 400 homes, and about 100 multifamily properties. So a total of about 500 doors. Uh, I've been um, uh, at property management for a long time. I like to tell people that I've been managing properties since I was five. (laughs) My parents noticed in the sandbox, because I have two younger brothers, that I would uh, kind of build a little wall of sand around my toys. And so my Parents knew right then and there that that kid's going to be a property manager someday. (laughs) Since I got out of college, I have uh, been managing property. Awesome. So that's great. So you've got a ton of experience. And, you know, what I think is going to be interesting here is to pick your brain because you've got kind of a different perspective as a property manager. So let's talk about some of the the things that, that you've done throughout your career to help your clients have more profitable rentals. So the first thing that you do when you're you're taking over a property from someone is you actually price the property below market value. Um, why? That, that sounds kind of counterintuitive. A lot of people to get top dollar want to price it as high as they can. But why do you find it's better to actually come in a little bit low? Okay. Well, that uh, goes back then to the quality of the tenant. I want a tenant with at least, this is in our area, the Bay Area, a 680 credit score, income that is three times the rent, and excellent rental history. And so that kind of tenant, that high quality uh, tenant has choices. They're looking at several different houses. And so Uh, In order to attract that tenant to my house that I'm managing, I want to be slightly below fair market, just $50 to $100. That way, uh, I'll attract that tenant. He'll feel uh, good when I show him my rent analysis and he sees that it's a little below market. He's going to stay longer, I believe, take better care of the home, as opposed to a tenant who feels like he's paying a little over market where he's being squeezed mm-hmm. and may think of leaving after a year or two and uh, feel a little resentful, yeah. and, you know, have more maintenance issues. So. That makes a lot of sense. And then what about when the lease comes up? Do you generally try to raise the rent for the second year or do, do you try to keep it the same to keep the tenant in there? 
Great question, Dan. Well, that all depends on the rent analysis that we do two months before the lease expires. So all of my tenants are on a 12-month lease, uh, some a li- actually a little longer because we want all of our leases to expire around May or June because that um, uh, is a great time for uh, the tenant to find a new rental, and it's a great time for the landlord, for us, to uh, bring in tenants as sure. opposed to November or December. So um, the uh, uh, what we do is a rent analysis about 60 days before the lease expires to see if rents have gone up in the neighborhood. And uh, we'll have owners say, Mike, I've got to have a rent increase this year. My taxes have gone up. Um, my expenses have gone up. We, we've got to raise the rent. And I remind the owner that their expenses have nothing to do with the uh, fair market rent. The yeah. only thing that uh, we look at with um, the rent are comps in the neighborhood. That's a really good point. I, I think that's something that a lot of people miss, that your expenses have absolutely nothing to do with the rent amount. You've got to look at what the competition's doing and you've got to price your property competitively. So I think that's that's really smart. Now, with the length of the lease, um, this is uh, the number two thing here, is that if a lease does come up in, say, the winter, in November or December or something, you won't sign a year lease. You'll, you'll get them on a shorter lease so that the lease comes up in May or June. Tell me kind of how you position that. Actually, Dan, if a lease were to expire in uh, November or December, we would want to sign an 18-month lease with the tenant so that it expires the following June. And uh, if I were to sign a lease, let's say, here in September, then it would be a nine month lease. So nothing, you know, usually between nine and 18 months. And then the following, when that lease expires, then we go year to year. Okay. Months Do you time. ever have any problems with tenants um, maybe being leery about entering into a lease for that long? Or is it all in how you position it to the tenant? Uh, most tenants renting houses are going to be there for at least two or three years. Right. Okay. And uh, we always say, uh, I I can understand you wanting to do that, but no, we go year to year, 12 months at a time. Now, another thing that I I think is a really good thing that you're doing is that when you decide on a rent price, you're not married to that price. After 10 days, you're looking at that price and adjusting. Uh, Tell me, walk me through how that works. Okay, well, basically, when uh, I uh, decide to, um, on a price, I run it by the owners, make sure they're fine with it. Some will say, Mike, I want another $100 or I want another $200. I believe that's too low. And what I'll do is actually in uh, give them a probability of the home renting based at the price they want. So uh, the, the average rental, Dan, for a three-bedroom, two-bath house here in the Bay Area where I manage houses is right around $3,000. Mm-hmm. The rents are very high here. And, and if an owner say, uh, say he wants 3200 I will let him know that I give that about a 10% probability of it renting here in the next 21 days. If we were at 3100 a 25% probability. But if we were at 2990, then I give it a 60% probability. So I always try to quantify um, numbers for the owner. And uh, then I will run the ad at a certain price. And if I'm not getting several leads per day off of Zillow, then I believe the home is priced too high. If I'm only getting one lead a day or maybe one lead every other day uh, at the end of a week or 10 days, I'm dropping in $100. Mm, yep. So is Zillow your main marketing source? Is is that where you find most renters are looking today? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'd say 70% of my inquiries come off of Zillow, Trulia, Hotpads. Okay. All owned by Zillow. Now, let's talk about the ad that you're putting on Zillow because you outline your credit requirements 
in the ad. Um, why do you think that's better? Is it just because you're you're letting people weed themselves out? Absolutely, Dan. You're not wasting your time or theirs by putting in the uh, tenant requirements at the bottom of the ad. So all of my ads state that the tenant must have a certain credit score. Uh, In most of my cities, it's 680. Income three times the rent, excellent rental history, uh, and um, uh, no smoking. Mm -hmm. So that uh, eliminates a lot of um, right inquiries yeah. from tenants that call in do, do people read call. it I, I always find tenants like they don't even read that you know or they'll they'll think well maybe they'll make an exception for me do, do a lot of people still reach out to you that that don't meet your requirements absolutely yeah yeah okay and if i ask somebody their credit score and they don't know it chances are it's uh, not going to meet the requirement right yep all right. Tell me about photography. Now, you always take professional or you have professional pictures taken for your listings, right? Correct. You don't do iPhone pictures or something. And I, I think this is interesting because I, I I know, you know, when you look at listings for houses for sale, a, a good realtor is going to have professional pictures taken. But I, I feel like a lot of landlords are just taking pictures with their cell phone and just throwing up pictures that maybe don't don't show the property in the best light. Um, do you find that it's actually worth it? Because I, you know, when you look at the cost to get a professional photographer to come over, it might be a couple hundred bucks. Do, do you find that you get a good enough return on that to make it worthwhile? Uh, I want to say uh, without question. Okay. The, there's been statistics done. I know in in real estate sales where professional photography makes a difference in terms of um, number of hits that a home gets, the uh, days on market. And I believe the same is true with uh, leasing a home. So er all of my competition, self-managing owners and other property management companies, all of them use their iPhone to take photos. Mm -hmm. They take five or six photos. They're um, average at best. Most of them are horrible. Yeah. And um, they just don't put your property in a good light. Yeah. My photographer comes always in the middle of the day to shoot my homes. He's uh, only there maybe 20 minutes, takes 10 to 12 photos, but he gets dimension. He's able to get uh, to, to um, make rooms look larger and uh, just gorgeous. Yeah. So, it, uh, it's really no amazing what a different. professional photographer can do the last property I sold, we had professional photos taken and looking at the house, I, I couldn't believe how good it looked. I mean, it, it looked way better than it did in person. We almost use the standard of a hotel room. When a that door swings open, you want it to, to, to um, look and uh, smell and feel as clean as a hotel room. Right. Now, as rental owners, we're all trying to get the highest return on investment that we can. Um, so, a lot of times owners are rehabbing properties trying to to be able to make the property better but i i think you can over rehab a property or make it too nice for the neighborhood how do you advise your clients on what to rehab and and what not to okay well dan uh you make a good point about over rehabbing uh, so many times i walk into an owner's house where he's called me to inquire about my services and he's already done the rehab. He's hired it out and I walk in and most often he's either done too much or not enough or the wrong kind of rehab. So rehab for selling a home is uh, not much different than the rehab needed for leasing a home. You've got, I start with the floors and uh, here in the uh, Bay Area, almost all uh, owners and landlords are going uh, with laminate flooring over carpet. Mm-hmm. Laminate is such a great value. It lasts forever, and you never have to replace it. Tenants want it. It's pet-friendly. It's hypoallergenic. So uh, I always recommend laminate. Then we look at the paint on the walls. We then look at the kitchen counters, quartz versus granite. 
We look at the kitchen cabinets, whether we can paint them uh, versus replacing them, putting on new hardware. And we move into the bathrooms and we see what uh, needs to be done with the vanities and the faucets and the tubs and the showers. Then we look at uh, the garden, to, uh, the front and backyard to make sure that the garden it looks nice. Uh, I always recommend low irrigation gardening as opposed to, to lawns. Um, so every, every recommendation I make uh, on rehab has a dollar amount. For instance, mm-hmm. if we put laminate in over carpet, that's going to equate to $100 a month in rent. And if we remodel a bathroom, both bathrooms, uh, then that's another $50 a month. So, you know, the owner can kind of quantify uh, the investment that he's making. And I, we always tell owners that for every dollar you put into rehab, you're going to get back at least a dollar and a quarter to a dollar fifty in added rent. Mm-hmm. Plus, hopefully a better tenant, too. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, average house, average condition is going to attract an average tenant. Right. A good house is going to attract a good tenant, and an excellent house is going to attract an excellent tenant. Mm-hmm. Very well said. Now, what about pets? Um, d- do you advise your your tenant your your owners to allow pets, or like do do you have a, a, a take on that? A very strong, Dan, because most of the owners that I sit down with when I'm making my presentation on uh, why they should uh, hire proper, hire me as a property manager, they uh, almost always say, oh, and Mike, we, we don't want pets in the house. And then, I, and so what I do is I go over all the benefits of advertising small pet negotiable. So we're looking at one pet under 20 pounds, because here in uh, our neck of the woods, these little teacup dogs are so popular right now. And uh, the the uh, we talk about the benefits of a of a small pet. Number one is you're going to have much many more applicants, many more people looking at the property than you would if you were to advertise no pets allowed. Second of all, it's going to make you more profit because if I have a home that's at twenty nine ninety small pet negotiable and an identical home next door. In every way it's identical is twenty eight ninety no pets, then my home at twenty nine ninety is going to rent faster. Mm-hmm. So it's going to make you more money each month. The tenant will stay longer, and um, they're going to be happier. And oftentimes, a tenant will try to sneak in a pet anyway. Right, right, right. Well, what about um, charging pet rent or an extra deposit? I also get a $500 non-refundable pet fee for my owner, and the tenants have no problem paying that. I don't charge them a monthly uh, rent for a pet, just a one-time non-refundable pet fee. You know, that's something I've debated about, whether to charge a a pet fee um, that's non-refundable or have a refundable fee, because I, I feel like if you make it refundable... It, it kind of incentivizes the tenant to not let the pet destroy the house. Um, on the other hand, the pet's probably going to do some damage to the house, so it, it's nice having that that extra $500 fee. So have you found that the non-refundable fee, it just works better? I have. Number one, it's uh, it goes to the owner. I mean, that's that, that goes in his pocket uh, for allowing a pet. And I have never, for let's say a a, a three thousand dollar a month house, we're collecting a three thousand dollar deposit. I've never seen a pet do more than a couple hundred dollars right. worth That's of damage. True. That's a true. A small, under twenty pound pet that is owned by a uh, high quality tenant. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to have an aggressive breed. They're uh, at most going to maybe uh, scratch a door. And uh, never, never seen it even come close to exceeding the deposit. Yeah. Now, one thing that I, I picked up on when you were talking about rent amounts that that you weren't saying three thousand dollars, you were saying twenty nine ninety. Do you always try to to end in ninety when you're pricing a property? 
I do. Yes. See, my I uh, uh, grew up in the furniture business. My dad owned a chain of furniture stores, so you would never see a sofa in my father's store priced at five hundred dollars. Yeah, it was always four ninety nine. A lamp one ninety nine. So I grew up with nines, and I've also uh, looked into uh, you know um, just research on on uh, pricing. A, a anything um, un, ending in nine, and uh, it has a psychological effect. Yeah. So the difference between twenty nine ninety a month for rent as opposed to three thousand dollars is a lot more than ten dollars. Right? Yeah, and, it's uh, it's funny. You know, I always think that you know, as people, we're we're smarter than that, but I I think we're not. <laughs> I think when it comes down to it, that that you you feel better. Uh, about a price ending just a little bit below the the full number um that, that that's interesting um all right so the the, the last thing i want to ask you about is a referral fee so for some of your multifamily properties you'll incentivize tenants to refer other tenants walk me through how that works oh well uh you have in the uh, multifamily properties that i manage a number of large apartment complexes, a lot of two to four unit properties. You um, have a vested interest with the existing tenants in who moves in next to them and or who's moving in down the hall. So by giving, by posting in the laundry room and on their doors, a, uh, for instance, uh, an apartment complex here in town that I recently had a vacancy, I offered a $400 referral fee to uh, all the existing tenants, if they could uh, refer somebody that would take the um, the vacancy, and uh, I've gotten a lot of referrals that way mm-hmm. because people uh, they all have friends and and uh, uh, relatives that uh, they would love to have move in close to them. Yeah, and so, I, I think that's genius because it, it makes your current tenants more sticky if their friends are living there or their family's living there, it, it makes them less likely to leave. So I, I, I think that's great. And, but you found the, you don't do that with single families, right? No. Okay. And I, I guess just because you, you don't, it, it's, it's just different. Is that, is that why you don't do it or it just wouldn't work as well? Well, I wouldn't know how to do that. You'd yeah. have to uh, put a flyer on every, uh, Right. Uh, right. Yeah. It's just more the, efficient. Uh, houses on the block. Yeah. What I do, what I do, uh, Dan, believe in is, is a, a for lease sign, a nice for lease sign in the front yard because, and a self managing owner can get a nice sign at any uh, hardware store. But that's uh, important, not just for drive by traffic, but also for, for uh, neighbors in um, around the house. Because again, they are interested in seeing a possible relative or a good friend move right in uh, sure. next to them. Absolutely. And so I yeah. get a, I've had a lot of people call me off my sign that have said, you know, I live right across the street and my sister would love to move into the house. Um, and I, of course, my first question is, do you know her credit score? <laughs> but, uh, well, that's, that's great. Pretty- Mike, thank you so much for for coming on the show. I I really appreciate it. This was I, I think really informative. I I appreciate you sharing your your knowledge with us. If anybody wants to learn more from from you, you've got some resources on your website. Tell me what you have going on. Well, on my website, Dan, I have about seventy videos for owners. They're all four to five minutes long, and they cover um, a whole myriad of topics on how to better manage your house as uh, or uh, your property, as well as a number of useful landlord forms. So um, feel free to go to my website. It's East Bay PMC, Peter, Mary, Charlie.com. If you missed that, or you want to look it up later on, I've got a link to Mike's website on my website. You can find it at rental income podcast.com slash episode two thirty two. If you love this podcast and you want to support it, the best way you can do it is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I love reading those five-star reviews. So if you could take two seconds and leave a quick review, I would be very grateful. 
I also want to take a second and thank our sponsor today. It's Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She is a nationwide lender and she specializes in helping people buy rental properties. So if, if you're looking to add to your portfolio or you, you're just trying to figure out how to get started and how to buy your first rental property, Chaley can help you out, get you going, make sure you've got the best financing in place. If you want to find out more, you can go to her website. It's RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E, LendingGroup.com. And if you mention Rental Income Podcast, she will waive all of the pre-qualification fees. NMLS 42056. I'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.